Welcome to our special sports edition of Asian American Life. I'm your host, Erna Bell DeMillo. All eyes are on Pyeongchang, South Korea, the site of this year's Winter Olympics. So we here at Asian American Life are celebrating Asian American athletes who are breaking barriers and inspiring the next generation. Breaking waves up close with two-time Olympic swimmer Leah Neal. Eyes on the prize. Stanley Cup winner Jim Peck debuts his Korean hockey team in the Olympics. Staying on point, Kyung Yoon visits one of America's top fencing schools. And returning home, Minnie Rowe reports on skier Toby Dawson's life after the Winter Olympics. This and more on Asian American Life. Two-time Olympic winner Leah Neal made history, becoming the first biracial woman to win both medals in London and Rio on a swim team. And she got her start right here in New York with the Asphalt Green swim team. Let's take a look at her rise to the top. Two-time Olympic champion Leah Neal feels right at home here at a pool and here having dim sum with her mom at Red Egg in Chinatown. What I come home uh, from college, like just being in Chinatown just like makes me feel like I'm just so comfortable there because I just feel like I'm home. <laughs> home is actually Brooklyn, where Leah and her two brothers grew up in a biracial family. Her father, Rome, is African American and her mom, Sue, is Chinese American. Yeah, and we would celebrate Chinese New Year together. And when we were younger, we would like celebrate Jun Cao Ji, like Half Moon Festival, and like play with lanterns and stuff. <laughs> we'll have like dim sum every so often together, and they still like make predominantly Chinese food. And yeah, we also always have um, red envelopes like uh, during Chinese New Year. <laughs> has that stopped, or you still get the? Yeah, we still, still get, we still still get it as long as we're not married. Right? <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Leah is also fluent in Cantonese, her mom's native tongue. If they grow up, they have a, a second language in Chinese that help them in the long run, in the, you know, whatever they do in life. For now, swimming is what Leah is doing in life. And this is where it all started, in New York, swimming for the Asphalt Green Swim Team the Aguas. We spoke to Leah at their Battery Park pool. So they've definitely been a big component of my life and have helped steer me in like a certain direction and I'm pretty satisfied with where I am now so like like very grateful for like um, having found Asphalt Green, having them have like seen the potential in me. Leah started taking lessons in their Upper East Side facility when she was six. Swimming was just like not even like in the picture until like my my classmates in the first grade were taking lessons and their moms were like you should uh, to my mom they were like you should tell Leah to like come join us too so like that's that's how we got introduced to swimming. It turned out she was pretty good at it. At eight, she joined Asphalt Green swim team on a scholarship. Once I was on the swim team, like I had a couple coaches uh, at. Agua who really saw like the potential in me and they're like like you know like Leah's like doing like pretty well like no one really like has this technique at this age. <laughs> um, my mom was like oh really like okay <laughs> like it never like phased her so like it never phased me either I just like did what I had to do. And boy did she while she was still in high school the summer before her senior year Leah made the Olympic swim team only the second African-American woman to do so. She not only won a bronze medal swimming on the relay team, but broke barriers, being one of the few African-American and Asian-American swimmers to do so. Next stop was Stanford, where she continued to collect best times and individual medals. Then it was back to the Olympics. But this time, she wasn't going alone. She went with several of her Stanford teammates, including Simone Manuel. It was the first time two African-American women were on the same U.S. Olympic swim team. We had a great Stanford showing at 2016, which also made it a lot more fun for me uh, than 2012, just because I was a rookie and I didn't really know very many people on the national team. Then it was back to school, where Leah, now co-captain of the team, led Stanford to a Pac-12 title and an NCAA national championship. In a nutshell, Leah's a two-time Olympic medalist. 
nine-time national champion, and six-time world champion medalist. All this before turning 22. Along with the medals, Leah has also become an unofficial role model for young Asian American swimmers at a time when U.S. swimming is looking to encourage more AAPIs to swim. According to USA Swimming, 66% of Asian Americans don't know how to swim, and those who do don't normally choose swim as their sport. AAPIs make up only 5.3% of USA Swimming's year-round membership, and only a handful swim at the elite level, like Leah Neal, including gold medalist Nathan Adrian, 12-time Olympic medalist Natalie Coughlin, whose mom is half Filipino, and the Kirk sisters who competed in 2004. To encourage more Asian Americans to swim, USA Swimming created its first ever Asian American Cultural Inclusion Guide. The Asian American Resource Guide was one of a series of five guides that came out. Um, they were meant to engage new audiences by using heroes in the sport that are specific to those communities, whether they were coaches or athletes. Because who knows, there may be another Leah Neal waiting to jump into the pool. Meanwhile, what's next for the elite swimmer with a Stanford degree and Olympic medals? I'm hoping to do some traveling and training with my friends from like around the world and around the country as well. Really looking forward to that just because I've never gotten the opportunity to do that, just because I've always been in school and like that doesn't really allow you to do anything. <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, another lap at the 2020 Olympics. I'm Kyung Yoon. Competitive fencing has been a part of every modern Olympic game, and until recently, it was a sport dominated by Europeans. But now we're seeing more Asian Americans participating and excelling in the sport. 18-year-old Jason O oh started fencing six years ago. Being an athlete, like, it's one of the best things you could do as a young as a young person growing up, because it basically teaches you discipline, teaches you how to work with others, and even if like you're not the best at it, because I definitely was not the best at fencing. Like, like when I was in middle school, I was I thought many times I should quit. But he stuck with the sport and went on to become a champion, meddling at a number of national fencing tournaments and World Cups. This fall, he will be heading to Harvard University, where he was recruited for the fencing team. Jason's coach is Yuri Gelman, a five-time Olympic fencing coach for the United States and founder of the Manhattan Fencing Center in New York City. He says that from the time he came to the U.S. in 1991, competitive fencing has grown in popularity, professionalism, and diversity. When I came, it actually was very, very beginning. And I would say it was uh, really amateur compared to Europe. Now we are professional. We are much stronger, and by numbers and by quality. And um, a lot of different people come in, and definitely all different race, no matter who. And we do have a lot of uh, African American, a lot of uh, European, a lot of Asian. And uh, it's become more and more popular in uh, actually different communities. This was reflected in the composition of the 2016 U.S. Olympic fencing team, which was one of the most diverse teams representing the United States. Of the 14 members, eight of the fencers were people of color, including three of Asian descent. 23-year-old Filipino-American fencing champion Lee Kiefer is the first U.S. woman to be ranked number one in the world in women's foil. Alexander Masialis, also 23 years old, has a Taiwanese mother and a Greek-American father, who is also a fencing Olympian and his coach. One of the top-ranked foil fencers in the world, Masialis won a silver medal in men's foil at the 2016 Olympics. And 27-year-old Garrick Lynn Meinhardt was the first U.S. men's foil fencer to earn a number one ranking in the world in 2014 and the first to win a world championship medal in 2010. My dream is to maybe eventually make uh, an Olympic team. 17-year-old Nora Burke has been fencing since she was 10 years old. A Sabre champion, Nora has medaled at a number of national championships. 
my mom's Japanese, um, and she's kind of always taught me since I was little to, you know, work really hard. Nora says she's been encouraged to see top fencers who are Asian Americans. It's cool for me because I'm able to look up to those fencers. Um, so, so yeah, no, it's it's great to see like people who look like you who are doing excelling at the sport that you're really passionate about. Um, yeah, I think it's really great. A high school senior, Nora was recently recruited by Columbia University for fencing. Yuri Gelman says being an elite fencer can help students get an edge in the competitive world of college admissions. It's, it's cultural. They're working very hard and parents very dedicated. They try to uh, keep children working uh, and uh, try to make them go to the best university. And uh, parents just realize that through sport, in particular fencing, they can get to the best university, especially include like all Ivy Leagues. And unlike other sports that require a certain height or heft, fencing can be accessible to an athlete of any size. We have tall, short, skinny, chubby, doesn't matter, really doesn't matter. It's here. What's it's here. It's here. Fencing is a very tactical sport where you have to like always think ahead in like your next action. Technique, footwork, tactics, strategy, something that the coaches just like drill into your brain since you're really little. Um, and also another big thing is psychological preparation. So, you know, a lot of the time athletes crack under pressure at tournaments. Um, so the person who can, you know, really perform the best is like the person who's mentally the strongest. As for the future, Yuri Gelman says he sees fencers becoming even more diverse as the face of the sport continues to change in America. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. For the first time, the South Korean men's ice hockey team will be competing at the Winter Olympics in 2018. And while South Korea may not be known as a hockey powerhouse, the man behind the bench certainly has the credentials to make his country proud. It's, it's not just having a dream and, and saying, I want to play pro sports, I want to be a pro athlete. There's a lot of work that comes along with it. It, it, it takes a village in order for you to become a, you know, a, a pro athlete. And no one knows that better than Jim Paik, currently the director of the Korean Ice Hockey Association and coach of the South Korean national team. But long before he took a job behind the bench or in the front office, Paik was the first Korean American to play in the NHL. You have to dream big. That's my whole thing. If you put a ceiling on yourself, it, then you're just limiting yourself. I think you can accomplish anything you want to accomplish. And in his career, Paik accomplished twice what some of the best NHL players in history never do once, winning the Stanley Cup both times with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Also making him the first Korean-born player to have his name etched on one of the best-known trophies in all of professional sports. In fact, Paik even scored a goal set up by hockey legend Mario Lemieux in the 1991 Stanley Cup Finals. Lemieux back through traffic, going to the North Stars in against Dahlin, put it right in front of Pack, he walks in, he shoots and scores! Jimmy Pack gets a goal in the Stanley Cup Final. And while Pig's goal scoring was occasional, his toughness was consistent. He was known as a defensive defenseman, helping his goaltender keep pucks out of the net and doing that which only can be done in hockey on a regular basis. Now we've got a big mix up. Oh, look at that. They're trying to keep oh, that. Here's Rob Brad. He is just nailed from behind by Jim Peck. There is always some discrimination. There's always those racial slurs, and there is. But, uh, you know, my philosophy was if you make a big deal out of it, then it's going to become a big deal. And Peck knew exactly how to silence those slurs. For me, it was water off a duck's back. I'll just beat you on the scoreboard. You know, I'll just outplay you. And then. And once your talents take over, they, you know, and, and I truly believe that hockey is one of the great sports where a lot of that doesn't matter. It's you're judged upon your talents and your skill level and how well you can do on the ice. And now that's Paik's top priority for all South Koreans, making sure they're playing the best hockey they can and hoping the international spotlight will do them some good as well. If you play extremely well, you know, now there's interest. Now you're seeing all the world watching you and say, hey, this Korean kid, he's pretty good. 
he might be able to. So now you're getting that exposure. While the entire men's ice hockey team will be made up of South Koreans, some of them were actually native North American hockey players who were playing hockey in Korea at the time and offered citizenship. I'm Andrew Falzone for Asian American Life. For an athlete, winning an Olympic medal can be a life-altering event. And nobody knows this better than Toby Dawson, a U.S. Mogul's bronze medalist at the 2006 Torino Olympics. His medal earned him a brand new family and a country that embraced him as one of their own. Keep it tight, though. The judges want to see tight skin. And Dawson's accomplishing that. Court 720 at the bottom. This was the run that changed Toby Dawson's life forever. Until then, he was Toby Dawson, adopted son of Deborah and Mike Dawson of Vail, Colorado. Then he found out he was actually Kim Bong Seok, a little boy who was lost at a market in Busan, South Korea, when he was three years old. I don't have any memories further from when I was a child, earlier when I was in Korea, coming over from, from Korea to the United States. As a young boy, Dawson, then Bong Seok, was grocery shopping with his mother in an open-air market in Busan when he wandered off into the street. One minute he was there, the next he was gone. I guess it was pretty crowded at the time, and uh, she was running around looking for me, but she was unable to find me, and uh, eventually I was picked up by the police and then placed into an orphanage. Dawson says he learned the details of that fateful day during his reunion with his biological father, Kim Jae-soo. He stayed in that orphanage for six months before he was adopted by the Dawsons and taken away to the United States. I never really thought about or even wanted to, to meet my birth parents. Um, it was not something that I was interested. I have a younger brother that I grew up with in the United States. He was also adopted from Korea. He actually came to Korea and was able to track down his birth parents. He got to meet them and it wasn't what he had imagined it to be. And he was pretty disappointed with the situation. And so I kind of wrote it off in my mind, like, mm, this is something that I don't want to put myself through. His adoptive parents were ski instructors in Vail, Colorado, and had their son on skis at an early age. It became apparent that he was a natural on the slopes. Dawson made the U.S. ski team when he was 19 years old and went on to dominate the sport in World Cup events, reaching the podium 17 times, including seven first-place wins. He was inducted into the Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame, but it was the 2006 Torino Olympics that was the pinnacle of his career and propelled him into the international spotlight. My mom always thought like if I was to be successful and make it to the Olympics, that would be the platform that I would be able to meet my parents. Right after the Olympic Games and after I finished my event, there were people coming out of the woodwork and there was so many interviews with the Korean media and things like that. And a lot of people were claiming to be my birth parents. And so that was overwhelming. So much so that Dawson, under the advice of the U.S. ski team, withdrew from a World Cup event immediately following the Olympics, scheduled to take place in none other than his birth country, South Korea. He retired from competitive skiing and tried to escape from the media frenzy surrounding him. I never brought it up. I never talked about it, but the Korean media knew that I was adopted. They knew that I came from Korea, and so that was one of their big stories. And then they started kind of, you know, with the media, they started doing the research and trying to put the, put the pieces together. Then, about a year later, came the news that most adopted children dream about. There was a man whose blood work and DNA matched Dawson's. In 2007, Dawson met his birth father. An intensely private reunion moment played out before dozens of cameras and reporters. When he walked into the room and I like basically could see myself in 
his face, I was like, I knew this man was definitely related to me and by no doubt was my father because of the facial hair and the facial structure and he just uh, was just an older version of me. Along with his father, a bus driver from Busan, Dawson was also reunited with a younger brother, a stepmother, a slew of uncles, aunts and cousins, and introduced to the Korean culture, cuisine, way of life. After 25 years of absence, there was a lot of catching up to do. It's like all the relatives wanted to pick up as when I was lost. So they were treating me like a four-year-old or a three-year-old too. So shoving food in my mouth and all these things, and which I have come to understand that's kind of the culture in Korea and that shows the affection of the people towards you. But to me, I was just so reserved and so taken back by that. Almost overnight, Dawson found himself living a life that he never imagined for himself. South Korea appointed him an honorary ambassador. Good afternoon. My name is Toby Dawson. My name is also Kim Bong Sok. And he was instrumental in helping secure the bid for the 2018 Winter Olympics that takes place this year in Pyeongchang, South Korea. Pyeongchang. <laughs> He accepted the position of head coach of the Korean national ski team. Before he knew it, he was packing his bags and moving across the globe. I didn't want to find my birth parents and I didn't want to go to Korea because I didn't want to turn my back on the parents that were taking care of me and loved me so much. And I didn't want to kind of turn my back on the country that has adopted me and taken great care of me as well. Dawson is now living and working in South Korea. He's building up the Korean national ski team and hopes to go for gold at the 2018 Pyeongchang Olympics. I think that the, the sport is so great. My goals for the Koreans would be to, when I walk away from the head coaching position, to be able to leave uh, a team or an organization that's self-sustaining and still growing and so that there's going to be a future in the sport in Korea well after the time I leave. He is also reunited with his birth mother in a private lunch away from the cameras where they could speak candidly about the years apart. She tells a very different story about his disappearance, how she left him in his uncle's care, and when she came home from work, he was nowhere to be found. Dawson says he's not sure who to believe. She seems so truthful and honest when she's talking about this stuff. And I feel like when I have our conversations, heart to heart conversations with her, she has nothing, she's hiding nothing. He says he harbors no ill will against his birth parents. But now, as a father himself, his son Max is about the same age as he was when he vanished. Dawson says he would never stop searching for his child. Emotionally, I would not be able to handle not being able to find my son. It would have been a constant search and I would have never give up no matter how many days, months, years have passed. I'm not sure how hard they were actually searching or not, to be honest. They say that they were, but it's tough to say because it didn't seem like the orphanage was so far off the beaten path that it would have been too hard to find. While the circumstances of how he ended up in the orphanage are murky, this much is clear. Had Dawson remained with his birth parents in Busan, he probably would never have become the Olympian that he is today. I think my life would have been much, much tougher, to be honest. Um, to, to grow up in Korea, I think that my parents, they were middle, low class. To be adopted, have super amazing parents that love me and take great care of me. I've been so blessed in my life. Dawson actively volunteers at Korean Heritage Camp, a camp for Korean adoptees in the U.S., and he dreams of one day starting an organization that can further help adopted children. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life.
you want to learn more about our sports edition, be sure to check us out on Facebook at Asian American Life. That's our show for now. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. Thanks for watching.